from Aberdeen in Scotland. And I'm talking about Malcolm here, who is who is who is with us. Mr. Malcolm Brown is coming in from Aberdeen, Scotland. Malcolm has over 30 years of experience in the industry as an IT professional, mainly centered within the energy, oil, and gas upstream sector. He is head of information technology for two oil and gas operators, Sterling Resources for about 12 years, and Ithaca Energy for about four and a half years. He has led IT transitions from on-premises to cloud services, managing the information and data management teams, and actively involved in the policing virtual data rooms for mergers and acquisitions. He architected and implemented cybersecurity solutions across the IT state in accordance with compliance and governance standards. Malcolm, it's a real privilege to have you here with us. Thank you so much for sharing your wisdom and expertise with our global audience today. Thank you, Rosé. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. And good day to everyone else. Thank you. So, um, <clears throat> humankind, we have a thirst for knowledge. And even from the earliest times back in the dim and distant past, we, uh, we wanted to leave our legacy behind and we, we, we put cave paintings on walls, some of which we can still see today. And as the, the eons progressed, we, we decided that we would, we would write, like to write things down. So we discovered papyrus and paper and we started documenting what we do. And then each of these things that you see on this diagram here today, um, the, these are what I call tipping points through the evolution of data storage. You know, we, we developed the printing press. We, we started mass producing the written word and sharing our knowledge with others and also preserving it for future generations. The punch card system was developed, which led to some degrees of automation in certain applications further down the line. And with the advent of the discovery of electricity, we started to understand the physics between uh, magnetic recording and the, the electrical world and how we can exchange information from one media to another. And that, of course, led on to the advent of magnetic tape and the hard disk drive. And as time progressed, we, we started to make things smaller until we started the first realization of portable media, which was the floppy disk. And then a little bit further on, we, we see the CD-ROM, which is the first development of a, a non-magnetic format for storing information and data. You know, and as our data sets grew, we developed data centers and, and larger, smaller, smaller hard drives, but larger facilities housing more and more data. And around about the turn of the, the millennia, we saw the introduction of solid state within the portable form of a USB flash drive. Mid 2000s, we see the development of cloud storage and the first public release available to us. And it reminds me of a story um, when I was uh, in my early days uh, in the oil and gas sector and I was uh, responsible for looking after uh, certain types of data. And uh, so one of my colleagues, uh, we, we started writing stuff to floppy disks and uh, we thought, well, where are we going to store these overnight? And we decided, oh, I don't know, we've got, we've got fireproof safe, they'll be okay in there, we'll put them in there alongside the paper records that are being kept. Oh, well, well, we discovered a problem with that. Um, fortunately, it wasn't ourselves, but this, this came through another source. Uh, they, they had a fire in their office. And uh, when they went to retrieve their, their floppy disks, of course, they were unusable. And we didn't really understand why but until we realized that the insides, the internals of a safe, fireproof safe, when, when it gets very, very hot and heat damages magnetic media. It basically erases it. And so we had to come up with a new idea, a tipping point, if you like, um, of how, to, how do we archive our, these disks and how do we keep them safe? And so then we started pushing data to outside sources to store the data for us in, in warehouses and, and keep them protected that way. But as data sets grew, we, we got larger, more elaborate, and systems evolved. 
And so we started doing things a bit more automated. You know, we had these big data centers coming along with lots and lots of storage. We developed tape libraries to accommodate that, pushed copies of the data onto those tapes and then put them outside for storage. And this is what we now see deemed to be the traditional archive and retrieval system. But uncertain times equals market volatility. And as we've seen over the last few years, you know, there's no certainties in the industry we're in. Two years ago, um, that the price of oil and gas plummeted, you know, down to ne it's nearly its lowest levels ever. And now we're seeing it, it's as high as it's ever been in the past. You know, these things are down to pandemics, political instability. And of course we have the new one on us, environmental pressures with our net zero carbon emissions. Most of our regulators have told us that they want us to become net zero as quickly as possible and given us very aggressive targets to achieve that. So we have these massive net zero expectations on us now as well to, to fulfill that requirement. And other expectations demands on our IT infrastructure. You know, our seismic data models from these large survey acquisitions we now take with high data, you know, we accumulate masses and masses of data surrounding the intelligence behind how we go looking for oil and gas. We've got the introduction of digital technologies and wearable technologies, you know, that we're, we're gathering heaps and heaps of data from. You know, we're using high resolution videos with multiple attributes like thermal imaging and ultrasonic scanning. And these are all adding to that accumulation of data. We're doing 3D modeling, digital twinning. You know, we can look at things in a holistic way now. We can wear a special headset and look at a component to see how it compares to what it should have looked like when it was incepted or what we think it should have looked like as time progressed and compare that to see where it's damaged or if, why it's not working correctly. We also have large mergers and acquisitions. You know, we're an industry that's renowned for that. You know, we joint venturing. All these things, it's all sharing data, it's all moving data, it's all accumulation of data. And of course, we need global access to that these days too. A lot of our organizations are multinational and we want to be able to share that data around the world and not degrade performance for end users. And we've got global resources as well everywhere that we need to accommodate. And we do all this within uninterrupted business continuity 24 seven. And so two decades ago, we were dealing with gigabyte data sets. And that's roughly where our technology today that we're using was born in that era for data sets of that size. And 10 years ago, we were now pushing into terabytes of data. You know, and that is when I started to see and realize that what we're doing for our backups and recoveries and business continuity plans was not going to be sustainable. There had to be a better way of doing this. There had to be another alternative. And now, of course, we're into petabytes and those same tools are really squeaking and, and groaning that they can't cope with that, that kind of pressure and that size of data. You know, and in a short space of time, we'll probably be talking about ex exabytes of data. You know, over the last um, 10 years, we've seen an exponential growth in data. And most of the data we're dealing with today has occurred within that time period. Gartner have identified this as well. And they see there's a next wave of storage infrastructure called data services. You know, and they're saying leaders must implement intelligent data services to power on through using software divine storage and hybrid cloud IT solutions. So this is the typical environment that we see today. And as you can see from this diagram, it's, it, it, it's not very versatile, it's not very practical. We have lots of regional offices, all with their own data sets within them. You know, if we want to move data to an engineer that's maybe here from here, 
We have to copy it onto some other form of media and then transport it somehow to get there. You know, that's not helping with our net zero targets at all by any means. You know, if anything, it's it it's it's encouraging us to to never get there because how are we going to do that? So we've got to find new ways around things. You know, we've also tried to deploy, you know, deploying remote access tools over high latency wide area networks to allow our data to be visualized in remote locations. But there's a snag with that as well. You know, although that technology has improved, it's still the case, the further away you get from the source of your data on these remote connections, the poorer the end user experience becomes as the response degrades as the latency increases. So those solutions that were devised and deployed two decades ago can no longer cope with the increased demand. Full backups, the interval between the full backups is increasing and we're becoming more reliant on daily incremental backups. We have highly complex solutions with using multiple different products, each with their own admin consoles. And because we distribute our data in various different locations, each with their own data silos, this opens up more avenues for threat actors to exploit. It just simply is not sustainable. We've now reached a new tipping point. We need to reimagine how we do things today, build simpler solutions that are designed for this era and the volume sizes we're now presented with, and that can grow with our demands infinitely. Taking a cloud-first approach is part of the answer, but there is very little value in just redeploying the same solutions we've been using on-premises for the past 20 years into the cloud and replicating those same techniques, since they will be prone to the same limitations that they currently have today. Using multiple products leads to complexity of design, complexity of administration, and inevitably to increased costs. We need to break the rinse repeat approach of buying ever larger storage arrays and recovery systems, which end up over specified or end up with limited growth capacity. We need to be using solutions that have been designed natively for the cloud to take advantage of those hyperscale capabilities on offer. With a single pane of glass approach to simplify the whole process and ensure that our data is inherently safe by design. Let's get rid of those data silos and centralize our data into a single master data platform that can be easily shared with multiple locations simultaneously without sacrificing performance for the end users. We need to reduce the number of times we copy data. That can lead to data loss and take the shortest path possible to getting our data into our systems and out to where it needs to be at the right moment in time. We should only ever have to ingest our data once. And this all needs to be achievable from any location, no matter how remote or what type of connectivity is used. From vessels out at sea, drill rigs, platforms, even our hydroelectric plants in isolated locations and have the data that they're creating be ingested and stored immutably in our new solutions and accessible anywhere after that. If we do this, we'll drive down our life cycle times and our costs. So what we need to do is create a golden master of all our data from day one. And the way we do that at the city is by using immutable objects. It's built on object storage natively in the cloud. We've turned the process on its head. We've said, let's make the cloud the center of the universe. 
put all the data into a single bucket in there in object storage, the cheapest form of storage available, it immediately makes it indestructible. It's immutable because it can't be overwritten. It's encrypted by design. So therefore it's protected. And then we can recover using snapshots, continuous versions all the way through. The data is ready to be used by analysts and engineers wherever they're located, anywhere globally with local performance within hours, if not minutes of being loaded. Your original copy of any piece of data, no matter the size, is where your intellectual property exists. We spend millions of dollars acquiring data, interpreting it, analyzing it, which is great. But we often forget about those small spreadsheets and reports that we produce based on those analyses. And that's actually where our IP exists because that is the realization of the outcomes. We need to be custodians of this data and ensure it is protected immutably and render it indestructible. And that's what we've done. We've made that a reality. We've made that possible. We've taken what used to be a physical, mechanical solution and turned it into something for the digital era. You can align writing a data to tape and taking it off-site with writing an immutable object and storing it digitally in an encrypted vault in object storage. And additionally, knowing that your original source is protected immutably, it means that when the time comes that you want to go back and look at some old data and reassess it with newer techniques that are available now, it can be brought back into use very quickly without having to wait days for it to be retrieved and recovered and restored from tape. So this will allows us to significantly reduce data center footprints. And for doing that, we're reducing the energy consumption that we're using. We're getting rid of these massive data silos. We're not burning energy, and that goes towards our net zero targets. We no longer need to move our data around the world by air freight or land freight. But you may well ask, aren't you just pushing that consumption elsewhere? Well, of course you are. Someone else is hosting the data for you. But the public cloud vendors have already addressed that, so these problems and are delivering on net zero today. So you're going to put your data somewhere that is already net zero, which has negligible effect on your own net zero targets. The file data platform approach that the SUNY have developed is a cloud native solution from the ground up. And it's taken all these factors into account. The power of the cloud. It's cloud agnostic. It can be on private, public, or even in your own premises in object stories there. We're agnostic, it doesn't matter. You make the choice, we'll host the data. And at the same time, we provide local performance for your end users so no one loses out. It's built on the cloud for today's and tomorrow's needs. One of the other things that we wanted to produce and that we've done so is scalability. Making your data sets and your tool sizes and what you pay for as flexible and as scalable as possible. You can prioritize your data into the cloud as quickly as you like. We can go from very small data sets to very large data sets. We can be deployed anywhere you like in the world. Currently we're 84 countries plus. Or we can deploy on one site for you or on hundreds of sites. It's scalable. It's flexible. And another great feature that we've got is that we now allow integration with collaboration apps. We can use their native features for co-authoring, 
sharing and exploring data. We can do it in a secure manner using tool sets we're all familiar with. And we don't have any of the constraints that some of these systems have on your character sets or file sizes. You know, I was doing a, a, a drilling campaign a while back and we tried to use SharePoint and we discovered a lot of the characters we use in the drilling world um, are actually special characters in SharePoint and they create all sorts of problems with duplicating folders, changing file names, and it, it, it just wasn't workable. Using our integration, you're using your existing file shares, but presenting them out through the collaboration piece. So familiar tool sets with robust backend, immutable storage, driving your data into these areas. Another thing we're supporting is the OSDU. As part of the collaboration initiative, we're working with them to achieve their goals. Their goal is to reduce costs, break down silos, enable innovation, and bring data together in one location. And that's exactly what our solution does already. So we've consolidated, we've built in protection, we've simplified management, and we've made collaboration available. However, in today's uncertain times, with large-scale cyber events being reported daily, we needed to do more. And don't forget, we're talking about data, the lifeblood of your company. And no matter how large or how small you are, only 20% of data resides in highly protected, secure databases for more enterprises. And we're very, very good at being custodians of that type of data. You know, we've worked hard at that over the years. But what we've actually not been very good at is the other 80%, the unstructured data in file systems with its scattered across multiple devices and file servers in numerous locations. And because of that, that 80% of data is vulnerable to threats. Simply because of that distributed nature and the number of users accessing it. If you got hit by malware today, what would be your chances of recovering fully? Sadly, we've heard all too often, especially in the case of ransomware, that none or only a partial recovery of data has been possible. You know, there's a, there's a company over here in Scotland that got hit by ransomware um, nearly 18 months ago now. And they have now had to publicly state they are unlikely to ever recover all their data. They only got something like 70% back after a ransomware incident. And simply because the technologies they had were not fit for purpose for today's environments. And worse than that is if you pay a ransom and you never get the data back. Everywhere we have a perimeter, including our cloud infrastructure, we should be deploying technologies that are inspecting the, the flow of data in any direction to mitigate any malicious actions that we see. In our network environments, and this applies equally to our information technology environments and our offshore technology environments, we should be using AI-based technologies that can monitor and see events that are happening that are out of the normal characteristics. And in the case of IT, be able to respond to those in an autonomous fashion without the need for human intervention. One of the greatest vectors of attack that threat actors have is through email. So we need to build in quarantines and triage that email before malicious content can get to the end user and be acted upon innocently in most cases. And on our end user devices, we're all too well aware of the, the need for anti-malware to sit on those because we've been using that for so long now. It's a, it's a given it's going to be there. 
But we need to couple all of these things with robust user campaigns to educate our end users on what to look for. Should something get through the system, which inevitably it will at some point at some level. And similarly, we need to be monitoring our as a service cloud solutions to ensure that nothing untoward is going on in there. And equally, if not more importantly, we need to detect and prevent data egress from our systems. This is your intellectual property we're talking about. Why on earth would you allow someone to take your proprietary information and give it to one of your competitors? Believe it or not, many people think that because they've created some content or designed a solution, that they own it and have the right to reuse it wherever they like. But that's not the case. You know, nearly all our employment contracts we have a clause in there for intellectual property. And it quite clearly states that anything you do while employed by this company belongs to this company, or in the case of a third party, it belongs to the company that's paying them to have the work done. But the one thing we'd be very poor at is policing that type of data loss. Yet we can report on it, we can see when an event has happened, but we've not had the means to stop it in its tracks. So even with the best security solutions in use today, it still isn't enough to fully protect our data. Threat actors are becoming more sophisticated in their attacks, trying to circumvent the defenses we put in place. They are now using similar tactics to those they used previously in process control and SCADA networks. By simulating the actions and behaviors of individuals and becoming that human interface in their, in their place. These new types of malware and ransomware threats do nothing that would trigger an unusual event on all that other information protection systems that we have. And they can sit quietly without doing anything other than just monitoring what you're doing. And they learn about the way you do things and what you have access to. So if there is a piece of malware resident on your end user device or your own laptop or whatever, because you've already authenticated yourself onto your network, it's already got the access it needs. It can simulate the actions of you and what you do. And it's got access to your file system. And if it's got access to your file system, it's got the same user rights you have on those files in your file system. And if it's got that, then it can modify files in your file system. And hey ho, guess what? They can encrypt the files. And that's what happens and how they get in there. So how do we counter this type of threat? We need a solution that gives file data platforms real-time protection. Real-time detection to allow better recovery against this type of attack and mitigate the disruption. And in the worst case scenario, if something does get through onto your file system, stop it in its tracks right in the file system so that you can get back to business as quickly as possible. The SUNY's ransomware detection add-on provides this real-time protection today in line right in the heart of your file system, notifying you whenever an event occurs and stopping the event in its tracks. It has intelligence wrapped around it that reports where the action originated, allowing you to take that system offline. It reports on the time of the event, so you know where to go back to to do your recovery. And it shows you which files and folders have been damaged, so you only need to recover those areas. And because it's built on the SUNY, 
you don't have to go back to tape to do your recovery. You go back to the last known good snapshot prior to the event taking place. And that is where continuous file versioning with the immutable objects comes into its own. They're protected and indestructible. They can't be overwritten. And if you look at the diagram here, you'll see this red one here, that's where the event took place. Everything after that has been damaged. The one in green before it, that's the time before it, that was the immutable object. That can't be overwritten. And so you only have to go back a few minutes in time to do your recovery. Very quick, keeping the business running, saving you money, improving your time to audit. And as I mentioned earlier, our traditional solutions can no longer cope with the scale of our file data environments. A backup that needs to be restored from archive can take many days or weeks to be recovered. Because of the scale, a full backup may be months and in some cases, a year ago, because of the size of the data now, we just can't back up everything in a full backup over a short period of time. It's as simple as that. And when you do the restore, you then have to validate the data that's come off the tape properly and everything's there. And then you'll have to replay all those intermediate backups back in to bring it up to the last known good recovery point, which could be up to 24 hours before the event, which typically leads to probably a loss of a working day. And then you have to read that, validate everything after you've done those incrementals to make sure all your data sets are complete, that there's nothing missing. And all that adds to the time it takes to do the recovery. Recovery times for hyperscale data sets of petabytes and exabytes need to be achievable within minutes. You know, we can't rely on these older technologies now that were fit for purpose 20 years ago to do the job today. They're just not capable. You know, physics gets in the way. It just takes too long to do the recovery. With immutable storage, with continuous versioning of the files, You've got recovery points within minutes of where you are to be recovered. You can get the business back into operation quickly and efficiently. And as Gartner identified in their earlier statement, a file data platform needs to be able to realize the potential of our unstructured data. So we've done all the consolidation, We've done all the collaboration. Now we need to put all that historical data to work. We need to turn that data into business value. So we've developed an analytics connector that sits right in our platform. The connector will connect to any analytical service. You can use it to find the relationship and sentiment of something. You can analyze your videos and images and extract meaning out of those. You can discover that sensitive data that's lurking away in your file system that's maybe non-compliant for, for PII and GDPR and things of that nature. You can extract that text and data and turn it into meaningful, usable business intelligence. These are just some of the cloud analytics services that can be used in the SUNY. Basically, any service that can read from object storage will work. You can create an image library of past projects, enabling staff to search for things usually tags, you know, like field asset interpretation, and all those kind of things that we use in our industry. We can tag things and make it very easy. It's a faster and easier method of finding work programs, modeling, and volumetrics to accelerate our projects going forward, improve our project quality going forward, and again, reduce our costs and get faster to time to audit. And what about all that merger and acquisition that we go through, the joint venturing? You know, we share a lot of data through those. 
But for some reason, we've convinced ourselves that we need to use a third party to do our virtual data rooms for us. You know, these solutions don't, they, they come at a premium cost. Why not do that for yourself? Why not do that in house? Why not have one of your information management team take on that responsibility? It was something I had to be personally responsible for in my time in Sterling Resources. You know, that was one of these critical points for me where I this was really struggling with some of the technologies. And I only wish back then I had a tool that was actually sitting in my file system that allowed me to do that rather than having to spend hours and hours copying data to some third party solution that, you know, and looking after all those permissions. It just wasn't practical. It's very time consuming. And it took longer for things to get done. Imagine if you could have your legal team with their set of file folders for this data room sitting there waiting to be used. And all they've got to do is go to the file sharing utility in the virtual data room aspect of it and switch that on for a, a partner to look at some data or a potential purchaser to look at some data. Very easy, very quick in-house, you've got full control. It improves the visibility of who's accessing the, the content. You can see straight away if someone's downloaded a file, opened a file, how long they had it opened for, and where they downloaded it to. All those metrics are available. All the standard features that you expect, like indexing, geolocation, and watermarking should one of those documents appear where it shouldn't be out in the wild. You know exactly where it came from because of all these features being implemented. And again, it's right in the heart of your solution. This will be a very familiar name to you, this company. And they are one of our, our biggest customers. And they had exactly this experience with outgrowing the current technology. So they turned to us for help and we were able to do that for them. Today, they've got over three petabytes of data stored. They're utilizing the tools in over 400 locations for 40,000 plus users using one cloud file storage solution with one master repository with their golden copy of everything sitting right in the heart of it. So the Nasuni file data platform is built for the cloud. At the center of it is our file system, UniFS, unified file system. Global access from anywhere, global access to anywhere, global ingress from anywhere. Local edge performance for your end users. The management console that's centralized. An orchestration center that takes after all the mechanics in the background that you don't have to do, hands free, and your analytics, getting that meaningful data out and get it used. Thank you for your time. Malcolm, what a, what a ter what terrific coverage by you and the team and Asuni on uh on on this very important area of uh of, of cloud storage and uh there are many many different questions and themes that have emerged as you're presenting so thank you again for great presentation you you really answer a lot of the questions that were brought up but one um some of the new nuances that came up that i want to bring up uh one of them has to do with uh uh network performance what is the impact that you see on network performance once you have you know no sunny system like this installed um what does that feel like because some people are making comments like you know is is does it it's always looking and recording things um does it drag the network down is it like some of the old virus scans that you know provided some good value but at the same time <laughs> brought everything to a screeching halt uh tell a little bit about uh the performance aspect of the network no it, it doesn't want that the the, the 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 edge appliances that we have um they basically are drop-in replacements for your file servers you have today whether they or a NAS device or a Windows file server. Um, so end users are interacting with those. They are scaled to be the right performance level for your environment. They can, they can be a virtual machine, which in most environments they are, or they can be a physical hardware appliance. Um, virtualization gives you more flexibility, obviously. Um, 
the tools that we've built have been optimized not to have an impact on performance. You know, that, that's the beauty of it. And, and obviously we're working to improve that further going forward. But right now, but there's negligible touch on the end user and negligible, negligible change into the way they feel and interact today. Very good. Uh, there was another question here. This one came from Christine, um, and, I, and I thought it was an interesting question. Uh, she said, um, you know, like three years ago, they were trying to implement, um, you know, uh, cloud storage solution, you know, similar to what you're talking about. And, and there were some technical uh, issues, but there were also a lot of, there was also quite a bit of resistance from, from more senior leaders in the organization. Um, and, uh, and then, and then technically it seemed like uh, things were not quite there yet. I don't know the details of her implementation, but that was the background. The, um, the question is, if you look at the development of technologies since 2020, early 2020, just pre-pandemic, if you will, uh, what would be, if she's going to go back and talk to her senior leaders again, from a technical perspective, what has changed, what has evolved since 2020 that maybe makes cloud storage better, more reliable, more secure? What would be you know, a couple of things that you would highlight? Well, first I would say is that um, the SUNY aren't a new technology specifically. You know, we've been around since 2009, you know, and that's only a few years after the first cloud storage, as you saw in my first, my first graph. Um, and so we've actually built the solution to be the other way around. We've not tried to take an old technology and make it work in the cloud. We've actually designed a cloud solution for the modern era. You know, we've made, we made it so that it could be hybrid. So you can have the end users working locally so that their file servers are where they are sitting. We've also made it so you can implement those same edge appliances in the cloud themselves and have the operation there. One of the differences for us is that because we're sitting on object storage, you know, our solution is infinitely scalable. You know, there's no limitations on file size, there's no limitation on capacity. So you can build out, and it's also very secure, right? Because everything's encrypted and kept, and you, you control the keys and all that kind of stuff. And it's just the approach because of the way it is different to the way that other techniques have been used, that that flexibility and scalability is just built into the solution. It's, it's something we've worked very hard to achieve and get that performance level up for the end users and maintain that for the end users so there's no um, surprises there for them. You know, and I suggest that um, Christine maybe gives us a, sh a call and we'll, we'll, we'll just go through a few options where they're on that because that's something that's worthy of discussion, I think, in, in more detail. Probably a bit too much to go into here and now. Absolutely. No, that's a good perspective. Follow up a bit more on the technical side of things. Um, a, a question that came up is regarding the implementation. Um, how much of the technology that Nasuni is using is proprietary for Nasuni? And you kind of alluded to this already in your answer here, but uh, to give a, a crisp or direct answer on this question, um, how much of the technology is proprietary for Nasuni versus third-party commercial providers that you're using for these implementations? What what does that look like as a as an estimate of ratios, if you will? Yeah. So the the only third-party element we use is the object store. Okay. So that can be from one of the public clouds, or like I said in my talk. It can be a private cloud or it could be um, on-premises object storage. That is the only piece that we don't control. You have no control over that. We just utilize that as part of our solution. The rest of the platform is Nasuni. So from the moment you build your first appliance and your control center, that's Nasuni. The and then everything from that scales out from that point. Very good. Another question that I thought was incredibly insightful has to do with uh, with an eye on implementation. Um, what do you, in your experience, what does what type of governance and capabilities are necessary to 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 get things in place in the, in a way that's well done? And governance here, I think, is in the context of you know decision rate, the decision making rights. Um, you know. Um, what do you look for for organizations that do it well? What kind of structure they put in place, team that they put in place? What does that typically look like to for an implementation like this? So on, from the governance perspective, it's no different from any file system using today. It follows exactly the same rules. 
it's joined to your Active Directory in just the same way as any of the systems using today are. So any uh, access control rights that you put on a file or a folder are followed through, you know, they, in exactly the same way that today. So it's exactly the same governance model that you would have today. There's no difference in that respect. And uh, tell us a little bit more about the capabilities, technical and the leadership capabilities that uh, you need on the client side so that you can have a smooth implementation? Um, leadership capabilities. Well, the idea- And, and a little well, bit of technical as well. Are you looking at, do you need a dedicated team to do this that with a certain technical expertise on the client side, that type of thing? Existing um, infrastructure storage team would manage this in just the same way they do today. In fact, they'll find it easier because it's one management console. Regardless of how many edge appliances you have, right? You only have one data store to look after, there's the key. All those appliances, or all those edges rather, point back to that same console, one console. If you want to host data in multiple clouds, all those volumes in each of those clouds point back to that same single console. And so you can share data from multiple clouds to those endpoints seamlessly. All the end user knows is they've got a drive location pointing to a data set, right? There is no difference where the data resides in the cloud, which cloud it's in, um, and it's same, And you can have multiple points running while using the same data or their own file sets, it doesn't matter. All right, we're officially out of time, but there's so many great questions about your presentation that I wanna squeeze another one here real quick. So if you can address as quickly as you can, uh, Malcolm, what about, uh, you know, one of the concerns is that on on uh, on this type of implementation has to do with, uh, you know, network reliability. And I'm talking more about, you know, sites that, you know, remote locations, I mean, Wi-Fi networks that don't work very well, you know, intermittent connections. I mean, how a system like this work on settings like that? Okay, so I have first-hand experience this because up until recently, I was still an operator implementing the SUNY in our environment, right? So we were able to put um, the SUNY edges onto platforms and drilling rigs. Now, drilling rigs are on very low bandwidth, as most people will know, right? The system is highly resilient because the, the edge appliance itself caches the information the local users are using. So even if the connection drops to the master store, they carry on working as normal. When the connection picks back up, then the SUNY infrastructure will pick up the changes and start streaming them back to the master store so that the onshore users can start seeing that data again. Very, very effective. Um, you, know, I'm, you know, I've been in that situation where it failed over onto, you know, or, or it lost connection altogether. It just recovered itself automatically. Wow, that that's impressive. Now, I, I, there's another question here about, you know, is Malcolm a guitar player or a drummer? But that question it will be answered in the future in a future session because people are looking at the background there and seeing all the instruments. That's pretty cool. So, Malcolm, what a great masterclass and introduction to a lot of organizations and leaders here on uh, the importance of the unstructured data storage and cloud storage for that unstructured data. You did a phenomenal job covering that. Uh, and uh, addressing issues that are which are pertinent to the industry. Uh, what is the best way for the audience who couldn't get answers uh, answers to their questions today to address to access you to access Nasuni and learn more about these capabilities? Um, just go onto the Nasuni website and and reach out through the the contact form on there. That will be the simplest way to get you to the right people you need to speak to for the region. Could you please, what is the Nasuni website? If you Is that www.nasuni.com? Oh, yeah, Nasuni.com. Nasuni.com, beautiful. Nasuni yeah. Perfect. Malcolm, on behalf of our global audience, thank you for a wonderful uh, presentation and insight on such an important topic. Um, on Thanks to you and the team at Nasuni for accelerating innovation that creates value. And this is certainly one of those technologies and implementations that do just that for the industry and in a time that's much needed with from a, from a management and security perspective. I mean, there's some very timely things you're bringing up here for all of us. So thank you so much. My pleasure, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, that was Malcolm Brown directly from Aberdeen in Scotland. Uh, sharing with us the blueprint for unstructured data from Nasuni. 
uh, tr tremendous uh, technological developments and implementations uh, for uh, storage strategies with unstructured data uh, in the industry. So terrific coverage. We really appreciate uh, all that Malcolm and the Nasuni team are doing to advance um, ideas that create value in our industry. Now, we are going to be taking a break here. And uh, at the top of the hour, we'll come back with one of the great leaders of culture transformation in the oil and gas industry. And I'm talking about Tim Wiggum, and he's going to be coming coincidentally from Aberdeen in Scotland, just where Malcolm is there. Um, I mean, it's not very common that we got a couple of uh, industry leaders from Aberdeen in the same session, you know, um, like this. So uh, coincidentally, we have uh, Tim coming in from Aberdeen as well and uh, must be a great uh, area of wisdom for the global oil and gas industry because uh, because of Tim and, and Malcolm being so close to each other. So we're going to be taking a break now. So if you want to ask additional questions that you couldn't get in here, say thanks to our sponsors, say um, uh, ask, you know, connect with our speakers directly. Go to the LinkedIn post under my name, Jose Perez on LinkedIn. You're going to see the Beatles oil and gas post that I have there where you can interact with uh, the speakers, um, like and share the post, um, ask questions, say thanks to the speakers and sponsors, um, really connect with them because their hyperlinks will be there for direct connection as well. So for now, take a break. We'll be back at the top of the hour with Tim Wigan, Head of Performance at Exceed Energy. <laughs> 